if people start sleeping in two different locations interchangeably at night, that that tends to be a really bad credit risk. So these people tend to use up a lot of cash in the near future more than they can afford. And the story they tell me behind that is, well, those are people who have lovers and having lovers leads to divorces and divorces are costly and costly divorces lead to loan default. So <laughs> whether that's the right story behind it or not, the, the boring fact is that using location data um, is extremely useful in predicting your fault. Martin, how are you doing, man? Welcome to the show. Very good. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Very, very happy to have you on today. We've recently been talking about some big data stuff. Seth Stevens Savidowitz was on recently, uh, and we were discussing about some of the interesting analysis that he'd done on Google searches and Pornhub data as well. Um, maybe no Pornhub today, but definitely some big data from yourself. That's right, yeah. Lovely. So give us your background. What do you do? Well, my background, um, I, I uh, grew up in southwest Germany, and uh, as everybody does who is from there I, uh, and has any form of self-respect, I studied mechanical engineering. Um, but at some point, I had the impression that um, I can much better understand what happens in the world if I study how the financial system works. And that's my made my way to um, studying economics and uh, going to the U.S. and ended up being a finance professor. And in the course of that, I somehow stumbled across this topic of AI and big data and started teaching it um, because I somehow felt uh, that there was a bit of a discrepancy between the demands uh, on our graduates in industry, you know, which concerns Python and big data skills, and what we taught them, which at the time was largely Excel. So I developed the ambition first to actually make MBA students teach, uh, learn some Python in class and apply it. And, uh, uh, of course, the ambition is not to turn it into data scientists, but to understand what the economics of data-driven businesses models is um, and can be and how we can understand uh, the success of tech platforms um, over the last um, decade or so. So quite involved in the development of how we analyze the data and pushing that forward. Yes. So, see, um, the, there are specialists on the analysis of data, and you call them data scientists or so. Um, what I'm trying to uh, spend time thinking about is predicting future directions of business models and uh, the development of workplaces and, uh, yeah, just how uh, jobs, firms, and industries get uh, transformed as a result of the, of the big data revolution. Okay, so this is helping businesses to make decisions through big data. That's right. That helps, that helps uh, business make strategic decisions on what the AI revolution means for them, uh, how they should position themselves. It also helps investors in deciding um, what kind of businesses they uh, should invest in or what kind of questions they might ask uh, businesses they consider investing in and distinguishing between the you know, thousands of different fintech startups who are kind of figuring out which ones of those that just have AI in the name, which ones actually apply it, and which ones apply it in a way that doesn't only solve a technical problem, um, but actually also has a decent chance of uh, turning a profit at some point in the future. I understand. So is most of the challenge that you're coming up against here a technical one with regards to the way that you can statistically model things and the, um, the scripts and things that you can write? Or... Is it more so on the side of how you interpret that data, how you apply it to the market and stuff like that? The latter. So the challenge is that there are very few people that have the combination of two skills or sets of knowledge. One is understanding what AI actually is and what machine learning algorithms do and specifically what they don't do. And the spoiler alert is if you read the newspaper, um, you don't really get a good impression of what that is. And uh, there are, of course, people who understand that, like the engineers that, uh, or data scientists that work with machine learning models. The problem with that is that very few of them have even basic um, economics training or enough of um, economics training to kind of uh, combine their data science skills uh, with economic theory in order to um, predict the future of industries and, and markets. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of structured thought about uh, business models and how they will change in the age of AI. And indeed, there was no book out there, which is why we wrote one. 
<laughs> yeah, so that, by the way, business of big data will be linked in the show notes below, of course. If you're interested in today, then head to the link there and uh, you'll be able to find out even more. Why do you need someone whose skill set straddles both areas? Why can't you just have the data science people feed out the data that the guys who understand economic theory and AI, like why, why can't you have them just work in tandem as opposed to, to have someone that bridges? Well, well, I suppose you, you can have them work in tandem as long as they can communicate to each other. But um, that is a challenge. Um, so if a data scientist talks to an economist who doesn't know what a feature is, um, that is a problem. If you explain to an economist that what the data scientists call feature, you call a variable, then all is good. But somebody needs to be there who translates between these two different worlds. And that's just, that's just a challenge that, that, that many firms have. So, so what happens if you don't have such a person? See, if you read the Financial Times or whatever, the business press, you might get the impression that AI is about making computers to think and to replace uh, human beings. Um, and uh, that the whole world is investing it. So what do you do as a top executive trying to um, allocate capital to various projects? You might call up the IT department and tell them, hey, why don't you, you know, do, do AI, do, do big data? <laughs> yeah. At which point the IT department uh, says, well, yes. Uh, and then they build a data pool and two or three years later, they ask themselves, so why exactly did we do that? And how does it fit into overall strategy? And what's the product? Who's the customer? Uh, what produces the value in this in this case? Or uh, you know you know the problem here being that uh, in many cases top management doesn't really understand what is at the core of AI and machine learning. On the other hand, um, engineers tend to get very excited about to- solving technical problems, and the technical problems ML solves is prediction. You predict some stuff, but then again, there's many things you could predict, and there's a lot of data you could use for prediction. But uh, ideally, that should be ins- informed in a business that strives to make a profit by what economically important and valuable parts um, of, of prediction are. And this is where the communication between the engineers and the economists or the strategists has to come in. And that communication suffers from just, you know, basically language barriers or, or lack of knowledge on both sides about what the other side is doing. I get it. I get it. So what does AI do? You've mentioned some of the things that it doesn't do. What's AI right. being used for mostly at the moment, other than preparing for a global takeover and to make all of our jobs obsolete? Well, ah, there you go. Exactly. So that's the kind of thing you read about, right? So Elon Musk talks about the singularity and stuff. And my point is not so much about whether that's a real thing and whether it might happen in 30 years. The point is that 95% of currently used ML and AI techniques is basically about a pretty boring technical problem, which is you use a bunch of data to predict some sort of outcome variable. So what could that be? Um, I know everything about, you know, uh, your uh, listeners' porn hub watching habits, as well as their shoe size, uh, hair color, uh, social network, phone records, and I don't know, a whole bunch of different variables, as well as their heart rate variability um, at night between 2 and 3 a.m., all their sleeping habits and exercise habits. And I might use all that information to predict stuff. What could I possibly predict? Well, I could want to predict, obviously, what kind of um, ads they're likely to click on. So what kind of products they like, what kind of movies they like to watch. But not only that, but also how much are they willing to pay for it? You know? So if I know that uh, you have a certain travel schedule because I tracked your cell phone location data in a, in a precise way, I might be able to start to infer how much you're willing to pay for airline tickets on a certain uh, route at particular times. And obviously that information gets valuable if you manage to exploit it in, 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 uh, in a profitable way. Um, so, uh, what was the question? (laughs) (laughs) What does AI do and what does it not do? Right. So what AI does is, uh, machine prediction that is generic in a sense of you have a bunch of data from the past and in context where the past predicts the future or the future works according to similar rules as the past. Uh, the generic types of prediction machines can do faster, better, and cheaper than human beings, and increasingly so, simply because there's more and more data around, more data than a human could possibly analyze. Mm-hmm. Uh, computational power gets cheap. These algorithms are very computationally intensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that stuff got cheap. So data collection, data storage, and computation got cheap, and as a result of it, machine prediction got cheap at a given level of quality. That's what it does. And it doesn't do anything else, really. <laughs> Computers... 
computers don't think. Like artificial intelligence has very little to do with intelligence in a in a broader sense. So it is true that a pretty big part of human intelligence these days is being used for generic prediction. But that's exactly what will change. Okay, what so like? This part will change. What like? Well, there used to be a job description called loan officers. Their job is to know your dad and your, uh, your, your mother, your, your friends, and your personal character as evidenced on the Newcastle soccer team or whatnot. Um, and from all this information, kind of predict how likely you are to repay a loan and hence whether they should extend a mortgage to you and at what interest rate and which, which collateral. That is a prediction exercise. The thing is, Nowadays, there are companies that know much better what your social network is and whether your dad and sister and social network repaid loans and uh, what your current health and mental health status is. And those companies are called tech companies or data aggregators and so forth. So they are just becoming much better and cheaper and faster at predicting loan default. What else might you predict? You might predict health outcomes. Um, you know, or the, the, the life expectancy. That's kind of useful when you run a life insurance company. Um, uh, you might, uh, as I said, uh, movie watching habits, uh, a lot of things. If you drive a car, you might predict whether this cyclist CC in the right of the road is likely to make a left turn anytime soon and get in your lane or not. All of these are prediction exercises. Um, yeah, once you spend some time thinking about this topic, you see that um, prediction exercises all are all over what we do in real life these days. And some of them are generic and based on a whole bunch of data and a whole bunch of experience. And those are going to get replaced. And others are non-generic. Mm. They're not based on a whole lot of data, um, <laughs> but are like fundamentally new. Here's an example. What about predicting how AI will disrupt your job or your firm or your industry? The thing is that's never really happened before. So a computer cannot possibly analyze a past data set when this has happened before and therefore predict what happens now. It has to be a human being. And that's a uniquely human strength. One of the blog posts that I read last year, which was really illuminating to me, was talking about the role of a top-end executive. And they classified a top-end executive as a difficult-to-replace complex decision engine. That was right. what they said that the, the absolute top end executives are. Right. And when you look at it from, you know, I, I appreciate that the, the listeners haven't read that blog post, but it absolutely blew my mind. You got to think the real value that is added by Tim Cook at Apple or by Elon Musk, it's not particularly his engineering ability. It's not particularly his marketing ability. It's not this, that, and the other. It is their ability to compile a lot of disparate, complex, interwoven variables and make the best decision based on all of those. So that's prediction day, right? That's prediction. It is absolutely prediction. I would, however, say it's non-generic prediction. In particular, um, they, they tend to create new products, no? Mm -hmm. So what they're trying to predict is what is demand going to be for a phone that doesn't have a keypad? Mm. I don't know if you remember that. I'm old enough to remember how the press was all over, how there's absolutely not going to be demand. And obviously, BlackBerry was on the wrong end of this. Mm. There's absolutely not going to be demand for a phone where you'd have to key in stuff on a touchpad. Well, how do you predict that? Yeah, it is a prediction exercise, but it's not that a computer can do because it's not in, it hasn't happened before in the past. So a, an AI algorithm, machine learning algorithm, cannot analyze the past data set to make that prediction. Absolutely, yeah. That's the, the, the safety mechanism, I suppose, that is inherent in being an executive. Being a top-end executive allows you to protect your own job by being the only person on the planet that knows that very particular set of variables and is able to extrapolate forward from that and say, this is what I think that we need to do. And I suppose that's where some people talk about business as an art form or being an exec as a, as a, or a CEO board member as being, being a creative artist in one way or another. And it is that, isn't it? It's taking all of these different variables and seeing something that potentially isn't in the data. Uh, so I agree with that. Now, let me uh, add one level of nuance. It's not so much about a job of a top executive, but it's about particular tasks that the executive might take um, that is more useful to think about. So... We, we right now talked about predicting the demand for a no 
keyboard um, cell phone. Well, what about coming up the creative process of even coming up with the possibility of having a no-touch touch phone? Mm -hmm. That so far is a rather uniquely human kind of activity that a computer has absolutely no um, advantage advantage doing. So the kind of, uh, I don't know, just intuitive creativity, um, I guess you're referring to synthesis as well. Mm. Seeing a bunch of trends in the world and somehow synthesizing them in an intuitive way um, in order to make these creative um, predictions, um, that is something that um, humans are uniquely good at, so far at least. Mm, yeah. Looking at uh, some of the stuff that we were talking about before, what, why does my bank care how fast I fill in a form? Why does he have to know that? Or why does he want to know that? Why does a bank care how fast I fill in a right. form? So see, this is an example right about in the book. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to uh, friends in China. China is, let's say, at least half a decade ahead in the AI um, and big data game. Is it really? Due, due to various reasons. And... Um, a uh, yeah, a friend of mine who who uh, is a head of AI research at a company called Huawei that you know recently was in the news once or twice, mm-hmm. um, tells me yeah you know one really important variable these days is how fast people fill out online forms. And I say what wait why? And he says well see first of all if you type your social security number or your national insurance number or however it's called in the country from which you're listening, um, that kind of tells you a lot about the person. If you can't fill in your social security number real fast, then you're probably a fraud or, I don't know, not particularly intelligent or something. I don't know. It tells you something about people's uh, willingness or ability to repay a loan or how big of an insurance risk um, they are. Or similarly, if you make lots of typos while filling out a form, perhaps you're not a particularly careful person. Um, but whatever you know, the theory is uh, behind why these variables predict outcomes well, they appear to work really well in predicting loan default um, as well as insurance risks. So companies start collecting it. <laughs> I never thought until I heard uh, this story uh, about that anybody might track how fast I fill out online forms, but they do. Wow. Yeah, that is, that is super interesting. I was on Skyscanner, a, a flight comparison site, only a couple of months ago, and the particular flight that I was looking at, I watched, I refreshed the page, and in front of my eyes, it went up by 300, 300 pounds. And I was mm-hmm. like, there's not there's not this many people looking at this particular flight to Vegas right now. There's me. There's me, and there's the guy sat behind the screen that's just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screw him to the tune at 250 quid. And then I went back, and I ended up booking the flight to Vegas just in between Christmas and New Year, and I booked it, and it had gone back down to below the original price. But it changed as I was looking at it. Refresh the page, changed as I was looking at the page. And I was like, there's a guy at Skyscanner that's just gone, nah, fuck it. Put well, it a guy or a machine. Or a, the machine's a guy as well. Yeah, yeah, you are right. There is a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a guy with a button, and the button made it happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, see, um, I have never... I asked myself for years why nobody does that to me. <laughs> <laughs> So you're the first time that uh, the first data point that I hear uh, reporting um, such an incident. Um, so I don't want to extrapolate too much about it. But see, it's a, it's an it's an interesting point, right? So uh, the website can see how interested um, you are and how desperate you seem to go in a particular date and particular time. No, so what they're predicting is really your willingness to pay uh, for a particular ticket at a particular time. Now, obviously, that can be very useful. But I imagine that you may not have felt super happy about that price increase. And obviously, they increased it so much that you didn't buy the ticket. Mm. I might even suspect that you might be less willing to use that particular site in the future if you suspect that they're using your search information against you. Yeah. So when you think about this from a business perspective, what a business executive might want to keep in mind as they seek to exploit the data various users generate is ethical considerations. If not because they themselves care about the ethics, but their customers might. And that might <laughs> turn out to be a business risk. No? And to get the kind of intuition of what makes people upset, that's kind of like really valuable. No? So Absolutely. people tend to get really upset at being charged a different price from another person. But you know what people really love? Getting individualized discounts. So you got a discount, but your neighbor didn't. Now when you think about this for more than like 
two or three seconds, you're like, but that's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. but it feels very different to people. No? Absolutely. And, and what we just described, all of the above, both coming up with variables that you never thought about um, could pot- potentially predict your credit risk, or the intuition about what people get upset about, these are completely human exercises. And it is precisely about predicting the future of AI and how they transform industries and jobs and websites and searching for flights and so forth, where humans have a huge edge over computers because it hasn't happened before. You know? So educating oneself about those particular areas is actually a great skill to have as the AI revolution takes along. Am I right in thinking that Amazon split tests its prices? I've heard some, some, some uh, reports about two people going on to the same product and Amazon doing a whatever it was that you mentioned, desirability to buy or desire to buy um, split tests on some of its prices for things, just by pence. So I don't know that for a fact. What I have noticed myself is that when I put a certain item in my basket, um, in my shopping basket, but I don't immediately buy it and I come back a while later to take a look at it, I'm frequently uh, confronted with the fact that the price of that item may have changed, increased, or decreased. Mm. Now, I don't know that this is because Amazon is running an experiment on me. What I do know is that this creates data. It does create data about whether I'm buying a certain item at a certain price or whether I'm not. And that can be analyzed and used um, in order to infer individuals willingness to pay for certain items now again i can't tell you how much deliberation is behind that and amazon would likely not tell me if i asked um, but for for sure this is one area where uh, listeners are becoming aware right now that they're generating data that people can go and analyze and use to um, estimate you know predict their future behavior mm. why uh, why does my car insurer care about my email address is that the same thing as the bank the bank filling in a bank form yeah kind of kind of like that i mean i'll just ask this uh, <laughs> to the listeners and you know do you know anybody who has an AO- aol address or my, my dad did until i forced him to get rid of it and then he <laughs> he upgraded to i think what he <laughs> considered to be modern which was a yahoo email address very good <laughs> <clears throat> so <laughs> suppose that I was offering an insurance product that I really don't want to offer to older people based on this particular um, uh, example that you just offered. Uh, I would as- assume that offering that to AOL and Yahoo users would not be in my best interest because I would be targeting an older audience. No. Mm-hmm. So it's not particularly because AOL per se or Yahoo per se um, are somehow bad or tell you that this person is a bad insurance risk. But being an AOL user correlates with characteristics or features of people um, that might very much matter for um, the riskiness of your insurance board. That's a data point. Inferred from that data point is a particular skew within the data that is... Uh, indicative of other things and you can use that to that's make, right make a judgment right. it's starting it's starting to fit together um what else have we got oh yeah checking your phone in the morning and where you sleep at night what about that tell us about that so that's another story of china uh, where people tell me it's hey, everything's hey. coming out of china martin <laughs> everything is at the moment fucking yeah, huawei all- huawei now i mean what's i'm recording on a logitech at the moment what's that what's logitech is logitech chinese uh, I don't know. I bet. I, I bet that it will be I, someone. Cool. Someone behind the scenes will own Logitech. They'll they'll have a, a controlling share from China. Uh, well, okay. So you have to update me here on on what you're after here. Just Logitech. Who are they? Where are they? Where are they from? Uh, it, I I thought they were Swiss, but I don't know who's actually behind them. So well, sure. that's it, China. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Uh-huh. Man. Anyway, so China. What time you check your phone and where you sleep at night? Tell us about that. Well, so, uh, so, so, so what they tell me is that um, if people start sleeping in two different locations interchangeably at night, that that tends to be a really bad credit risk. So these people tend to use up a lot of cash in the near future, more than they can afford. 
And the story they tell me behind that is, well, those are people who have lovers and having lovers leads to divorces and divorces are costly and costly divorces lead to loan default. So <laughs> whether that's the right story behind it or not, the, the boring fact is that using location data um, is extremely useful in predicting default. Let's have a less juicy story and just say, see, say you're Uber or Didi when you want to go to China. And you know where a person lives because, you know, you have stored a home address in your in your app as well as where you work. That gives you a really good idea about what the guy's annual income is. No? If the person moves to a richer and more prosperous neighborhood, that tells you something about whether their salary end up, uh, what kind of restaurants they eat at, which, of course, as a ride hailing company, you know, because that's where you drop them off or pick them up. It tells you a lot about a particular person as well, no? uh, simply how fancy the restaurant is. So obviously you can infer a lot of things about the person's current um, liquidity <laughs> situation from simply analyzing the location data and nothing else. And guess what? Didi, a year ago or two, um, actually started a lending arm, as you would expect from a company that knows so many things about individuals that are relevant for predicting loan default. Wow. <laughs> well, you, see, okay, so, you know, it, it's, it's fun how I can impress people. Um, the, the way I do this to, in MBA classes is to tell them the economic theory of how clearly a ride-hailing company um, should be offering a lending products sometime soon. And I did that in the class, and I, 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 I earned all the respect by my students because a week later, Uber started um, announcing no way. that. So, now, the thing is, I didn't actually predict that. I just knew that Didi had done it a year earlier in China. So, Got as, you. I, as, I, as I said, it's not very hard to predict what happens in this world as long as you basically follow what's happened in China over the last five years. Why, uh, why is China so far ahead with this? Well, I think there's at least four reasons. Let's see. Uh, we, we talk about some of them in the book. Let me see if I can still get them together. I mean, number one, I said at the beginning, what machine learning is really useful for is analyzing huge data sets. Otherwise, you can use con conventional statistics. Now, China has a large population in a reasonably homogenous economic system. You know? So, well, just by virtue of that, you have a lot of data. But also, for each of these individuals, you have lots of different data points because for various reasons, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese people appear to tend to be less uh, privacy concerned or if they're privacy concerned, they just get a lot more convenience out of the apps they have. So with the kind of apps uh, that, that WeChat, say, offers, um, you can do a lot more things than with WhatsApp in the U.S., right? So if you think of uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, trying to merge Instagram with, with uh, WhatsApp and Facebook data, that's what happened in China many, many years ago. Mm. So their messaging app, you can already transfer money. So essentially, you have a, a, a useful currency there. You can make your doctor's appointment and you can buy your life insurance. So you can do Through all WeChat. kinds of things. Yeah, basically, it's all in the same app. They call it a super app. Okay. So, um, Shit the bed. Um, now, so, so I said, well, uh, why is it useful to have all these apps within one app? Wait, think about this. I just said you make the doctor's appointment in the same app that you buy life insurance. Well, you know, guess what? You can probably predict the remaining life expectancy of a particular person a lot better if you know what kind of doctor's appointments they're in the process of making. No? Mm. Um, so this just illustrates that uh, using data that you generate in one part of the business can be really useful in another part of the business. So having all these diverse sets of businesses under one roof, and you might say, why doesn't messaging service you know, help <laughs> with merging that with Facebook or Instagram data? That's yeah. kind of like the answer. You get different types of variables about the same people. And that turns out to be incredibly useful for predicting, well, all kinds of stuff. The thing that is coming to mind now as we talk about this more and more, it's obvious that there's massive amounts of data that are being collected it's also obvious that some of these data correlates are really useful for companies. Right. That makes them powerful. Right. One of the problems that everyone that's listening can will think of is, right, okay, so let's say um, my life insurance provider has direct access to my doctor bookings. From the company's side, I can see why that would be great. From right. the customer's side, that could be great. 
or right. it could leave me suffering at the hands of higher insurance premiums that potentially aren't fair or anything else. And based on the company's ethics, based on something that's completely out of my control now, I'm at the mercy of this company which knows more about me than I do. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so, where does it, so I think you mentioned a lot of different things. So one is fairness. Some, pe- some alarm bells might ring and you might, people might find, find things unfair. Well, the company might say, well, you're, you're free to not use your, our app. But the problem is it's kind of hard to be a functional use, human being in today's society without any using some sort of technology. I know some people who try. My, my, my cycling buddy from grad school is now a computer science professor at Berkeley teaching machine learning and in particular fairness, by the way. And uh, his wife works at Google in an AI team. And he does not have a smartphone. <laughs> Fuck, man. This is the same that, as, is it? That scares me. <laughs> is, it Elon, is it Elon Musk or Tim Cook that doesn't let their kids have iPads in the house? Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, you know, it's kind of, it's, it has, has a similar spirit to it. No? Now, here's the thing. I, I thought about the same because I don't particularly like the idea of my uh, privacy being invaded by I don't know whom. But on the other hand, I really like to use Google Maps because otherwise I'm having a hard time traveling and getting to places in a reasonable amount of time, you know. So basically, there's a trade off between privacy and convenience, you might call it. An anecdote I like to tell is in in 2006 or so, the U.S. started taking fingerprints when you entered their country. And it was a huge um, uh, outcry in Germany about how this is outrageous and how can they and so forth. And people should just boycott traveling to the U.S. and so forth. I said, well, that's all very nice, but I just got an offer to go to grad school in the U.S. Am I actually not going to go to grad school in the U.S. because of the fingerprint thing? And obviously the answer is no. No. Now, uh, uh, fast forward 12 years later, I travel across um, uh, country border, uh, borders like twice a week um, and use these automatic, you know, uh, scan your passport, scan your face kind of portals. And it goes a lot faster than the old passport control. And I'm perfectly happy about it. No? So, yes, they use my personal information. They know all kinds of things about me, all my biometrics. I have no idea where the data goes and who <laughs> uses it. But it's just so much more convenient. And this is basically where things come down on. I think we, 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 we got into this when we talked about China. When I talk to the, my Chinese friends, they say, well, it's not that we're not concerned about privacy, but it's just so freaking convenient to use these apps. So, and in this trade-off, we just come down on the side of, well, yeah, I guess, you know, people know everything about me already anyway. So pff, what's the point of me? Um, uh, going the going con- off the grid. Like going off the grid. Yeah, like, like your friend. Is that the primary benefit? For, from the user side, convenience? Because it seems like other than convenience, you're at the mercy of the ethics of the company for better decision making. Well, see, so it's, it's not just the ethics, no? because again, if there's competition between companies, customers might get upset and switch companies that actually protect privacy. Mm. And you know, that's how the whole topic of big data interacts with antitrust uh, law and antitrust enforcement, which we can get into or not. Um, but, but I'd say, see, from an economic perspective, you can say um, the companies, the, the first step that uh, machine learning, machine predictions do is just it lowers the cost of stuff. Uh, Uber is just cheaper uh, than a taxi company for various reasons, but one of the reasons is you don't have a human being that is trying to connect a person that calls a taxi uh, you know, phone hotline with a driver who's currently in some part of town. You just don't have that human being in the loop and you make that process more efficient according to conventional economics. No? So that's, that's the first benefit. You get just the, basically the same product, cheaper, better, and faster. That's a lot of benefit for the consumer if there's no abuse of, of the information. No? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You then alluded to, oh, but you could do all kinds of nasty stuff with the data. Well, yeah, that's a concern. That, uh, especially uh, looking into the future, uh, customers might be concerned about being price discriminated. So being charged precisely how much they're willing to pay. Because mm, so you know, you know uh, you've got an indication of where they work and where they live. And from that, you can deduce a salary and you say, well, this person that's going from a poor area or whatever, we can charge them a little bit less. Or the guy that we know has just had a raise and just bought a brand new 
half a million dollar house, we can charge him more. That's right. Or you might imagine that a ride hailing company um, might at some point uh, sneakily ask you before showing you a fare for the ride, will you accept this ride no matter what the fare will be? And that actually happened to me. No uh, way. And I was in a rush and just clicked yes, but because whatever, and that particular mode I was in a rush and said, wait, snap. What the I just fuck have I just done? I'm completely price insensitive. They could have charged me whatever they wanted. Yeah. So that was probably not a particularly smart move on my behalf. Mm. So I want to I want to get into the the trust side and I guess the litigation side of this as well, because there has to be well, there might not be. You might tell us that there's not. I would think that there has to be some limits to what companies can do with our data, and I'd love to find out about those. But first, I just want to ask about China. Like, why why is China so much further ahead? Have they got better engineers? Is it just the fact that they've got all of this data to play with? If the US had as much data as China, would they be able to be as uh, uh, half a decade ahead? Right. So, so yeah. So let's get back to this topic. So I said more people. Then they have better apps that are more convenient. So people are willing to spend more time on the apps and thus generate data. Mm. Uh, they manage to collect more features. Then there's basically no privacy or antitrust, antitrust uh, roadblocks like GDPR uh, there of a comparable nature. Just the wild then, west in China, is it? And they, they do have a ton of engineers who work on this stuff. Like just one auto or one insurance company, uh, Ping'an, has... Uh, uh, more than a thousand engineers that do nothing else than uh, than uh, programming AI. You no, know? and you you're, you're going to have to look for uh, an insurance company in the West that uh, pushes this agenda anywhere near as much. If you go to the academic conferences and see the, not only the number of submissions but also the fraction of acceptances, you start to see China a Chinese university is just getting way ahead um, at this point uh, in the, uh, from the West. So it's it's all of the above. It's all of the above that uh, makes China have an edge. Mm. Okay, so antitrust. What is antitrust? What's that? Well, antitrust is uh, otherwise otherwise known as uh, competition law or the enforcement of, of competition laws. And this relates to this topic um, in, in various ways. Uh, one of it is, uh, we talked about Facebook previously and their desire to merge WhatsApp, Instagram, and, and Facebook data, which previously they said they would never do, but now apparently they changed their mind. Um, and the German competition watchdog, the Bundeskartellamt. Um, what a name. What <laughs> an course. unbelievable name. Can you say that again? What is it? Bundeskartellamt. Oh That's my really just God. one that, word. That is amazing. Um, <laughs> it's so badass they, in German, isn't it? Fuck they made the following God. argument. They say, see... Um, it's not illegal to be a monopolist. What is illegal is to abuse a dominant position. And here's the argument they made. They said, see, people care about privacy. If there was a social media network site uh, similar to Facebook that offers a similar benefit, but that is not Facebook, and that actually cares about people's privacy, people would potentially uh, uh, choose that alternative site over Facebook. But such a site doesn't exist. And Facebook does not honor the privacy preferences of the users. Hence, is Facebook is abusing the dominant position. So this is obviously paraphrasing what the argument is, is uh, roughly is. And they simply prohibited um, Facebook from merging these, these diverse data sets as it pertains to users that are under their jurisdiction. And I have absolutely no idea how that is actually measured. I'm German, but I don't live in Germany, so I don't particularly know whether I fall under that or not. Is it where the your signal's being, coming from? Is it where your phone is registered? Is it where your <laughs> phone was bought? Blah, blah, blah. Is it where you currently are? I have no clue um, how, how that actually works. The point here is just to illustrate that uh, competition enforcers can actually come up with effective arguments in order to throw roadblocks into business models that try to pry on um, uh, getting information from these different uh, parts of the business, you know, as we just described, is happening in China right and left. Facebook is trying to do it as well. But uh, especially in Europe, I suppose, uh, uh, regulators are are throwing roadblocks into these kind of attempts. Is part of that because in Europe, you've got this, you could look at Europe as one big country that's federal, essentially, and you'd have to jump through the hoop of France, then the UK, then Germany, then Norway, as opposed to in America where you've just got one thing? Or is there something systemic about Europe that is anti-data, anti-big tech? 
Uh, it's a good question. See, GDPR is a Europe-wide thing, no? And the example and I no just gave is a, no equivalent in the US, right? There's no equivalent in the US. Um, in the in the US, particular states are starting to get very sensitive about these issues as well. Um, but it's certainly it's certainly very different. So I think yeah, it's both a federal and a European-wide uh, issue that there seems to be more uh, care taken with respect to uh, data privacy. It's surprising to some, you know. Um, Norway, for example, if I'm correctly informed, having Nest, you know, those home video camera mm-hmm. kind of things, mm-hmm. is kind of illegal here for privacy reasons. You can't have that, uh, which obviously is not the case in the US. And mm-hmm. people are surprised about this because they say, wait, is Norway a country where everything is transparent? You can see your neighbor's salary and I don't know what, and the, co- the, the government collects all kinds of data about you. That's what my American friend says. And I say, in response, I tend to say, wait, have you heard of the NSA, it's not like <laughs> it's not like your government doesn't collect the data about you. They just don't make it available just for don't research. Tell you, you know? they, don't, they don't tell you about it. Yeah, exactly. Have you heard, uh, I don't know what the new product is from Amazon, one of their new products, uh, maybe like one of the Echo Dots or something like that. And as everyone was opening it up for Christmas, there's some stories of Amazon engineers being on the other side of it, um, pretending to be Santa Claus and doing all sorts of weird stuff. There was a lady who got death threats from the other what? side of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, is, this, is, this is legit. This is legit. I, it's people with people in Amazon fucking with everyone. Oh wow! So I didn't read about these particular ones, but I mean, I think what you're illustrating is just that there's just a real, let's call it business risk, if you take the perspective of the business, um, in how people react to the innovations that you're offering them. And again, there's a convenience trade-off and the privacy thing. And the question is, which way you rub people more, you know, and whether you find Alexa more intrusive or you find it more useful. And um, I guess that's the, that's kind of like the cutting edge that companies have to navigate at this point. The bizarre thing is for the people like myself, I guess, who I don't fully understand all of the privacy concerns, but I, I've I've watched enough Netflix documentaries to be scared, right? But <laughs> for me, for me, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about that trade off with something. So I don't have a, a Amazon Alexa or a Google Home Pod or any of that sort of stuff. I don't have that. I don't right. have it particularly because of a privacy concern. Right. But if I was to buy one. I would think about it. I'd be like, right, right, okay, well, am I am I prepared to forego my privacy for that? For me, it's not a massive a massive element of my decision making, but it would be in there. And what's interesting right. is that when you get to see behind the curtain, which is my sky scanner example, right? Mm-hmm. Had I have been anchored at the higher price, had I have logged on and refreshed the page and it had stayed at the lower price or I'd logged on the first time and it was at 700 pounds, the higher price, and then refreshed the page and it had stayed the same. I, first off, I wouldn't have this story to tell you. Second, I wouldn't have mistrust in the site. Right. So <clears throat> part of the game that's being played here with regards to our privacy and the way that data is being used is the transparency of our cognizance about it happening. Not whether or not it is happening, it's whether or not the user becomes aware of it. And that creates right. that creates an environment for the company to purposefully try and be as obfuscating around what's being on what's happening with your data as possible. Well, it's true, or to frame it differently. I previously said that people hate individualized pricing, but they love individualized discounts, you know. <laughs> so it's a question of how you frame stuff as well. And yeah, I mean, you know, some companies at the cutting edge of this are are way ahead of that consideration already. But you know, many others will follow and have to make these sooner decisions. I want to I want to throw in, um, like, um, switch uh, switch sides a bit and make an argument to not scare people. It's pretty easy to scare people yeah. <laughs> yeah. with these privacy concerns. But here's another one. So say, why do I have a cell phone? I do have a cell phone. I have a smartphone. Uh, among others, because I find it really useful. But even if that wasn't a dominant consideration, do I really help myself by uh, not generating all this data? So say um, say I was concerned that a health insurer is, um, is using all kinds of data about myself to price my health insurance. Am I actually concerned that I'm a worse health insurance risk than the average person in the society I live in? Probably not. I'm kind of like in shape and, you know, do sports and I'm generally healthy and all that good stuff. 
So I might actually want the health insurance company to know all these things about me if that makes me get a cheaper price than I would get without the phone. So true, they might still exploit my willing, you know, my uh, extract some of these rents. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I might still get a much better deal than I would without generating all this data for them. So it's not entirely clear that, uh, you know, living in autarky actually uh, prevents you from leaving a, a trail. Because if you then apply, then you belong to the to, to the set of people who don't have a smartphone. <laughs> yeah, and think yeah, about who yeah. that is. Yeah, <laughs> the people that live in the woods, you know? all they're doing is feeding on whatever they can find around the outside of their shed. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, you, you it's totally not correct. It's that I want to be counted as those. You know? Yeah. Which side of the fence do you fall on? Because previously, when it's us versus company, there's always been these tricks of the trade, you know, mm-hmm. like sort of between maybe the the 70s. And you hear these stories about um, Bill Gates getting free phone calls by like phone hacking, putting in particular tones back through the receiver to be able to make free international calls. Like that was one of the first things he did, right? So there's this, there was this period, this golden era, where companies were able to offer us services, but they hadn't caught up with all of the different ways in which people, the users, could obfuscate their information, right? right. So you could be a guy who looks perfectly in shape, but know that you've actually smoked 20 a day for the last 30 years, and then somehow get around that and get to whatever. But if your health insurance company knows your bank records and sees that you've bought a packet of cigarettes every day for the last 30 years, you can't get around that. But again, right. the, the problem is, or the, the concern is going to be, when do I fall on the side of the fence where it would have been better for them to not know this information about me? Well, you won't know. <laughs> they know, um, but that's that's part of the problem. So see, um, the game you're describing is definitely being played and will be played a lot more. Uh, there are these these Fitbits or how you know whichever company you 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 work with that counts the number of steps. Ha, you have one. I see. Um, uh, and um, why am I telling you this? Oh, right. Um, if you know that your insurance premium goes down, if you take more than whatever 10,000 steps a day, at some point it might occur to you that just making your dog run around with it during the day is a much uh, <laughs> less deserving way to, <laughs> to achieve the same outcome and produce the same data. This man's, this um, man's doing 70,000 steps a day. He's a psychopath. That's amazing. And he can yeah. run at 43 kilometers an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, in China, you can actually buy small electrical devices that do nothing else and shake around your Fitbit uh, during the day on your desk. You're kidding. Uh, no, of course you can. But at some point, <laughs> it, occurs, it has to occur to the data scientists analyzing the data that the users are actually trying to generate a certain, um, uh, you know, a certain um, type of data um, that you're incentivizing them to produce. So you might actually have to change your algorithm and say, hey, we have to correlate the heart rate of the guy or Fuck, uh, single man. thing. Um, That's when you need to and, attach it to the dog, isn't yeah. it? But you're gonna have to shave. You're gonna have to shave yeah. a little bit of the back of the dog's <laughs> exactly. back of the dog's paw so that you can get a good connection for the optical uh, the heart rate monitor. Exactly. So all this to illustrate that this is a dynamic game and the stuff is being changed. And um, perhaps this is a useful a useful place to talk about what computers can do in this game versus humans. Hmm. This conservation we just said is a completely human uh, interaction. A computer would never come up with that, that perhaps something has gone wrong with, uh, you know, how people use the the Fitbit or the app. Yeah. Um, it's this poor, this poor really person has been having a seizure for the last 10 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, um, or what? This person can have a heart rate of 247. Yeah, That's kind of yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, a computer would know what to do with that. In the end, it's a human being who stands behind that, which tells you that it's not that computers are intelligently analyzing data sets. Computers compute stuff. That's what they do. But the intelligence has to sit behind the screen and have a, you know, a human brain attached to it um, and come on in creative ways, uh, have theories about w- what generates a data set, what causes the data to be generated the way it does, and therefore, which changes in the company policy or incentives that you offer to your user will actually have what kind of effect on their behavior. And that's a completely theoretical exercise, right? You're saying, hey, if I change prices, if I change the step incentives in a certain way, how will that cause people to misbehave? Or you offer penalties for abusing it, or I don't know what you do. Mm. Uh, 
this is stuff that has never happened in the past. So a computer cannot analyze a data set and predict what, how people will behave in response to that. It's a completely human prediction exercise. And this is where the opportunities lie in that field to think about uh, what complements, economists say, what complements uh, cheap machine prediction. And the answer is like intelligent humans that understand what the computers do and creatively think about uh, uh, you know, the ethics, uh, uh, economic theory, think about whether uh, you only see a correlation in the data or whether it's causal that uh, have some sort of moral compass or mm-hmm. understand how users think about um, the ethics of what you're trying to collect in terms of data um, collection. I don't know who have humor. Have you ever seen a, a computer come up with a joke? So no, I, like follow, I, f- I follow a guy on Twitter who keeps on posting these images that he says are um, uh, machine learning uh, scripts for stand-up. Now, I think that they're him writing them as if a machine did them because they're so side-splittingly funny. Um, <laughs> and it's like it involves the – it includes the audience interaction and stuff like that. It's absolutely insane. I don't know. I, I haven't seen a computer be funny. Not yet. Yeah, right. So people people are actually trying to do this, right? And and puns. Computers are starting to be good at kind of puns. And you can see why, because you're just analyzing a whole bunch of language mm-hmm. and puns that people find funny. And you know, then you can predict what kind of uh a combination of words people find funny. Okay, mm-hmm. fine. So far so good. Uh and you know, they're successful, whatever, fifty two percent of the time. So that <laughs> that is <laughs> I don't know. That's probably a better rate than me in the classroom. It's, but, it's funnier um, than me. It's funnier than me by miles. <laughs> uh, but, you know, um, it is, it's doubtlessly true that computers by now can, can come up with funny puns. So you have a, if you have a human being that selects all those that are funny and then gives them to an audience, great. <laughs> that worked. Um, but it's still a human judgment that's behind the, uh, that's behind the exercise. Got you. So... One of the things that you've mentioned so far is computers struggle to predict in situations that there's no, essentially no precedent for. Yes. Will that change? Well, people are trying, but let's, let's say this is the main, the main point we're trying to make in the book is that's 95% of what you read about in the newspaper, like thinking computers essentially, but it's very, a very small percentage of what actually happens in the real world. What happens in the real world is that people assemble humongous data sets about your behavior and predict which movie you want to watch next. Okay, So that's the stuff that actually happens that's economically viable. So as people think about what actually affects their real life in the next five or ten years, it's definitely not thinking computers. It most definitely is a bunch of fancy statistics that is really boring uh, to, to talk about it's a bunch of engineers, yeah, analyzing big data sets, and that's it. It has nothing to do with with thinking computers and all these, uh, you know, more exciting and hence more headline generating um, things that you that you read about elsewhere. I suppose you know, thinking about Nick Bostrom or Max Tegmark, they're they're kind of either utopia or dystopia, depending on how you look at it for the future right. of AI. When you look at what they talk about, they're not talking about essentially the world's best statistical modeler what they're right. talking about is artificial general intelligence right they're talking yeah, exactly. about a thinking a thinking computer but it That's was right. it would seem at the moment you know there was that there was that um at a particular conference a few years ago someone asked a room of experts how long did they think it would be before we reached artificial general intelligence i don't know right. whether it was a singularity but it was certainly artificial general intelligence and like the the consensus was like 50 years, like before, definitely right. before 2100, right? And, and by the way, that was a consensus in the 1950s too. The same, oh, the same distance from the night. So it's 50 years from 1950s and now 50 years, and it's just moving as we, as time goes on. Okay. That's so, hilarious. See, see, so whatever the right number here is, the point here is people have talked about this for decades and decades. Yeah. And the horizon has shifted out. See, uh, you can call me wrong if it happens next year and and I ridiculed the idea. But as you say, um, the closer people are actually to the, the forefront of research, 
the further out in the future it seems to be that they expect artificial general intelligence to be there. Yeah. So our point is exactly, hey, this is very exciting to talk about and people have and it's a very appealing thought to human beings apparently. Mm. But what actually matters in the real world right now and what affects people's lives is boring statistics. Mm. And that the, the, my point here is we've got – this is when it's going to happen. Artificial general intelligence, you know, this is what's super intelligence, which is one of my favorite books. And everyone who's listening who really, really wants to kind of get a good grasp of how artificial general intelligence might come about should read super intelligence by Nick Bostrom. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of the Terminator, uh, romantic view that is being put in the press, but that's not what's being economically rewarded right now. What's being economically rewarded right now are big data sets being analyzed cleverly so that you can make good predictions. So you have to presume that as we move forward, the resources are going to be um, disproportionately moved in that direction. They're going to be discriminated towards what can make Amazon make more money or what can make my insurance company make more money. Not should we throw a trillion dollars into maybe making artificial general intelligence when we don't know if it's possible. That's exactly right. So this is exactly the point. See, see, if you want to see what currently makes money for businesses, look at the market cap of companies. And you'll find companies such as Amazon, Google, and Facebook up there, don't you? Uh, or, of course, the Chinese tech, tech giants. So what do they do? Well, so one thing I showed to my MBA students is an annual report of Amazon in 2006. And so that's, you know, like 14 years ago or 13 and what you see is Jeff Bezos talking about that they have the ability, the data and the technical ability to analyze what economists essentially call uh, price elasticities for demand. So if you change the price of a certain good, how are people going to react to it? Are they going to buy more or less of it and how much more and how much less? The techniques by which you analyze that, that's basically just dead boring PhD level or actually more like tenure U.S. top university professor level um, uh, statistics and econometric uh, modeling and this is exactly the people that amazon hired over the last few years is literally like hundreds of phd economists that analyze these data sets so if you want to use what produces a trillion dollar market cap you just have to see what they do and it's just you know um econometric or economic modeling a whole bunch of data science on huge data sets has absolutely nothing to do with uh, uh artificial general intelligence and that's what it's kind of, yeah. That's so, what's re you know, that's what's recording uh, rewarding companies right now, right? That's what's right, that's exactly. what's getting them getting them to to. Well, and 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 the financial markets expect that to reward companies in the foreseeable future, right? Because that's what market caps of companies are. It is expect mm. expectations of future profits. Talking about it on a wider scale, then we haven't touched much on the global economics of this, but. What's your predictions moving forward? Is this going to change anything? Are we going to see market caps and and um, <clears throat> those predictions moving more or less? Or you know, is it going to change the way that the actual financial markets themselves are, are, are going to be manipulated or going to be judged by by the companies that are looking after them? Uh, yes. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, please, so please go on. So I'm a finance professor, so there's a risk uh, of me delving into, into finance topics a little bit too much for, for, um, for this audience. In financial markets, uh, the most successful hedge funds and, and market participants are precisely those that have used computer science and uh, models for the last few decades um, predicting uh, future stock returns, and it works like a charm, and, um, and people are rich. Okay, fine. So in financial markets, there's a huge transformation happening not get too much into that you're asking a much broader uh, a much broader question so i get invited a lot to like investor conferences um that are like i read about ai in the newspapers a lot and there are thousands of startups but first of all is this just a fad and second if it's not just a fad then which of these thousands of startups am i supposed to invest in how do i think about this and and what i tell them is well see why is there so much ai it's because there's a lot of data, hence big data. Why is there so much data? Well, because it's cheap to collect data, it's cheap to store data, and it's become cheap to analyze it. Okay? And when a product is cheap, people buy a lot of it. An economist says, demand curves are downward sloping. But okay, you can forget about this again if you, if you don't care. When things are cheap, people buy a lot of it. It's really cheap to collect data. I can get your cell phone location data if I a data ag aggregator, a few hundred bucks, and they will tell me where you are. It's very simple. Um, 
it used to be implausibly expensive and I need to hire a private detective. No longer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, some guy some guy in a leather a, a leather suit and a big sort in of wide brimmed hat. Yeah, smoking. That's, that's right. <laughs> so hmm. Okay, so that's why that's the year. Now, is this just a fad? Well, unless you tell me a story why data collection and data analysis is suddenly going to become way more expensive again, the answer is no, it's not just a fad. It's gonna stay here. Now, let me, let me put a small disclaimer in there, which is I can actually tell you a story why it becomes more expensive to collect and, and process data, and it's called legal constraints. Think GDPR in Europe. No? So sure, if politicians wake up to, or, uh, to, to these concerns or, or are convinced by these concerns, they might throw roadblocks in it. And it's going to differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And therefore, if you're in this business, that's one really important consideration you should have in mind as you get into this field. Well, which leads to the second question, which kind of businesses should you invest in, given that you want to invest in the space in general? Uh, or which one companies should you want to work for and so forth? I mean, one, is, one question is concerns the legal jurisdiction, but the other one is understanding what the economics of their business model is. Is it a business model to make better predictions than the competitors and therefore like offering a better product? Okay, that sounds great. Is there a business model to have some sort of uh, useful thing people like and that people are willing to give up their personal information for. What, the, the example I always think of is like uh, uh, scooters, you know, inner city scooters or bike sharing and stuff. The question of these business models has very little to do with whether the fee people pay to rent a bike actually pays for buying the bikes and, I don't know, keeping them charged and maintained. The economics of it is that you sell the people's cell phone location data to a data aggregator who sells it to Facebook or Google or whoever wants to buy it, which they use to target ads. <laughs> okay, so let me let me go backwards in this value chain. Obviously, correctly targeting ads is a valuable thing to, from a business perspective, but you need a bunch of data for it. Where does the data come from? Well, in some cases, the companies like Google and Facebook collect the data themselves. But in other cases, for other variables, like how fast do you type your name in an online form, mm. um, they might buy it from a data aggregator. The data aggregator buys it from whoever first came up with the idea of measuring how people, how fast people buy stuff in an online form. And whether that's an online form for car insurance or an online form for I want to rent a scooter in Madrid doesn't matter the first bit. No? And this is why I'm saying, hey, the logic, the economic logic of business models really changes um, as data itself becomes valuable. Because the whole point of your business model might be to collect a bunch of data, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the product. If you program a flashlight app for a phone, but somewhere in the terms of conditions, uh, you say that you also want their entire address book and their, 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 their location data, um, how fast do they type the names and track all their activity on the internet. I mean, if you get people to sign up for that, um, well, good for you. You don't More need power it. to you, yeah. <laughs> you don't need it for the flashlight app. No. So I'm sounding very cynical, and I suppose I am. This is not an endorsement of these kind of practices, practices or me saying uh, this is ethical. All I'm saying is like, this is what is happening out there in the real world. Indeed, there are ethical constraints to it. Indeed, legal constraints are there and start popping up. But that's the economic logic of how business models um, are changing. Presumably as well, because this is such a fledgling market that's moving so quickly, the there's an asymmetry in terms of how many people want data to be more available from the company side, uh, how sophisticated they want the modeling to be able to be and the decisions that can be made off the back of that versus <clears throat> me and you thinking... I, I don't want my data to be sold to these people. I should speak to my local counselor who's busy like dealing with like a, you know, a proper, like a flood or like a real, a real sort right. of real world problem that's going to make news as opposed right. to me and you saying, I think if this keeps going over the next 20 years, this could be like Orwell's 1984. And, you know, that like, so where does the rubber meet the road with regards to protection for users? Well, I think it's a societal decision, see? Um, and in the, in the end of a political game, so as we actually alluded to previously, in Europe, uh, both individuals and politicians seem to be more on a cautious side concerning uh, data collection. Uh, and in some ways, in just in a vague sense. And as I said previously, I don't know, maybe that's a bad thing. I mean, first order, uh, having more data enables better decisions. So as long as it doesn't get abused in some sort of way. 
uh, having companies that, I don't know, give me, I love Uber, uh, having taxis in, in the small town in the US where I lived for a long time was a disaster. Mm. I loved Uber coming along and offering me cheap rides. No? So, so first order, this is all great. Uh, the question is just when the concerns come in, and that depends a lot on how many companies start abusing uh, the power they, they, they have thanks to the information and uh, how politicians react to it, either to the company's concerns or lobbying efforts. Uh, yeah, or, the, the, uh, lobbying, the lobbying must be so – that must be where I would imagine companies like Amazon and Facebook are really ratcheting up their spend. You know, if first off they needed to get a lot of computer scientists, up next they need to get the lawyers and the lobbyists who can protect the work that the computer scientists are doing. Yeah, and the economists, I suppose. So see, all, what you get from all of this is a sense that – there's going to be a few winners in this space and there's going to be a bunch of losers no? and obviously that's a societal concern everybody talks about inequality and this is one mechanism by which you know which can drive it um and as i said i don't expect this to stop anytime soon it's going to go faster in some jurisdictions than in others uh, it, it goes fastest in china for the reasons we've discussed so if you want to see whether you want to live in a society uh, you know that has very little regulation around this, these topics. Uh, you can look there and see if you like it. There's many things I like about it. Go to Germany and try to pay with a credit card in a supermarket. It's going to be hard because they like cash. Meanwhile, in China, you walk past the supermarket counter, they scan your face, and that was it. You're kidding me. Oh my me. God, is that beautifully convenient? You know, uh, it's similar like the airport, the airport face scanning technologies, whatever. It's it's not a technical problem that has been unsolved. I mean, how much would you like to not have to stand in line at a supermarket because uh, some person in front of you is trying to, you know, count individual coins to get the precise amount, you know, mm -hmm. like in the 80s. Scan my face. I've put my stuff scan in the bag. Face. Scan my I've face. There. You know, it's just incredibly convenient. So I, I do not want to be paternalistic about which kind of society we want to live in. It has huge benefits. Um, to live in this more technologically advanced world. Mm. My prediction is that likely we're going to move in that direction more than not. But to which extent and how fast and in which jurisdiction and who makes the money, that, those are the exciting questions from yeah, an individual perspective, an investor's perspective, a potential employee's perspective and so forth. And we can watch China. We can just see what happens in China. They're like the, the canary in the coal mine or the monkey that got shot out in space. And it's like if their if their entire society breaks down and it, it it becomes a dystopian waste world where Mad Max is is running around <laughs> everywhere, then we know we're like, all right, let's just pump pump the brakes, Elon. Let's have a let's have a let's have a chat. Like just chill out a little bit for a while. Right. So I mean, see, um, I hope the sense that that listeners will get from this is that it's definitely not a time to just sit back and just because you can still pay with cash in your supermarket uh, it's fine. to think yeah. that you're kind of like immune from this. That's not how it works. You're just five or ten years behind. And this is not ideally where you want to be in this space because, as you said, it's moving incredibly fast. Mm. Well, man, Martin, today's been, uh, today's been awesome. Where should people head? They want to get the, big, the business of big data. Amazon? Got it on Amazon? That's that's what they should. Um, that's that's where to find it. That's the only place to find it, in fact. Got you. And I can't wait to hear um, people's reactions. It's it's our first book on this topic, the first attempt at it, and uh, we'd love to hear back. Yeah, I've got to give a shout out to Yuri as well. So the the guy, your is your co co author on the book. Right. So we got to know each other um, when I was a grad student at Princeton. He was an undergrad, and he wrote a popular book on statistics. And I always thought that was an oxymoron, but he somehow managed to pull that off. <laughs> so that tells you something about that, that he's a really, really good and funny writer. Um, and I very much enjoyed, um, uh, enjoyed him there and working together with him on the book. And I hope it shows. Man, he's, he's awesome. I've been in touch with him ever since I got introduced to the browser uh, by David Perel last year. I've been in touch with him just back and forth, just nerdy stuff. Like I'll send him something. I've seen this thing. Do you want to have a look at this thing? And he'll always, he'll always take time to reply to me. Um, so yeah, if you haven't the, to the, the listeners, if you want to sign up to a service, which allows you to get, uh, curated articles every day and then a, a synopsis of them at the end of the week, this has been the only reason I actually think that I'm interesting over the last 12 months. Like the only reason I have anything interesting to talk about is because of the browser's daily emails where they send me like random articles about uh, like how high a pig can jump or like, you know, like the, the, 
But whatever that's it might be. Right. Yeah, it's that's exactly what it is. But yeah, that'll be linked in the show notes below. Yuri, thanks so much for the link up, man. Uh, Martin, business of big data will be linked in the show notes below as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been awesome. Go and uh, go and put some sellotape over your webcam and, and make sure that Amazon aren't watching you do naughty stuff in your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.